Hello, I'm your host, Kyrie Douglas, and welcome to Catalyze and Computing, the official podcast of the Computing Community Consortium. The Computing Community Consortium, or CCC for short, is a programmatic committee of the Computing Research Association. The mission of the CCC is to catalyze the computing research community and enable the pursuit of innovative, high-impact research. In this episode, I interview Dr. Mark D. Hill, Professor Emeritus of Computer Sciences at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Mark recently joined Microsoft as a partner hardware architect. His research interests include parallel computer system design, memory system design, computer simulation, deterministic replay, and transactional memory. He is the Chair Emeritus of the CCC Council. In this episode, Mark discusses the importance of computer architecture, the 3C model of cash behavior, and overcoming the end of Moore's Law. Enjoy! So we're here today with Mark Hill, former Chair of the Computing Community Consortium, and now retired from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, moving to Microsoft. How are you doing today? I'm doing very good. It's a pleasure uh, to be here with you, uh, even though here is is cyberspace. <laughs> um, so could you tell me a little bit about yourself? What is your background, and how did you get involved with computer science? Um, so I grew up in Detroit. Uh, neither of my parents had bachelor's degrees, but they made it clear to my sister and I that we had to go to college. And so I never questioned that. And I kind of liked math and science. I thought math was, you know, not a good way to earn a living. And as a lower middle class kid, earning a living was very important to me. So I picked engineering and computing was particularly fascinating. And I, I had an early success in ninth grade and a science fair project, I actually built a mechanical adder using numbers that you might put on your door to to, uh, give the address of your house. (laughs) And, you know, so computing fascinated me, I guess, as I went further along, because uh, when I told a computer to do something, it did exactly that. And no one else in my life did. (laughs) In fact, it did exactly that. Even when I told it to do the wrong thing, it faithfully did it the wrong thing. But the process of then trying to make it right, called debugging, is kind of like detective work, which I actually liked as well. And so, computing has been, uh, you know, worked out really well. And early on, you know, this was in the 1970s. I was in high school. Uh, most people didn't really know what computers were because. Uh, the personal computer hadn't come out yet. So computers were these mysterious things that you saw on television. So one of your primary research interests is computer architecture. So for people who don't know, what is computer architecture? So computer architecture is the big picture of computer hardware. Computer hardware has many complicated things, but somebody has to deal with the big picture. And the name architect comes from the analogy of a building architect who also has to handle the big picture of a building, even though others may be greater experts in the plumbing or the electrical system. And in both cases, you have goals that you want to maximize, let's call it performance, and you have to do that within cost constraints and uh, physical constraints and, and standards and things like that, right? Buildings have to meet certain electrical standards and computers have to meet certain communication standards. Computer architecture is low down in the computing stack. So it's not very visible to society. I would liken it to uh, a foundation of a skyscraper. It's, that's a very essential thing. And if you want to build a taller building, you need to build a better foundation, but it's not something that people tend to notice. And we computer architects have been all about taking what technology gives us with Moore's Law and more transistors and turning it into Uh, better and faster computers. By the way, another question you could ask me is, why did I choose computer architecture within computer science? And my answer to that was, I just loved how we computer architects get to cheat. We get to make things that are better than the pieces that we make them out of. And so um, I deal with caches, which we may become at later, which makes the memory appear faster than 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 it is. And other people do processors that make it appear faster 
than they would be if you just use the underlying technology in a straightforward fashion. And I found that fascinating. Has most of your work been with hardware or the exchange between hardware and software, some combination? Much of the work has been hardware, but it deals also with low-level software. But even when you do hardware, uh, there's theories going back to Alan Turing that all hardware can compute the same thing. And so the difference is how well and efficiently it does. And so you need to pay attention to software and what the software is doing in order to do good hardware. So you're credited as the inventor of the widely used 3C model of cash behavior. So what is a cash and what is the the 3C model? Okay, so a cash is a small transparent buffer that holds the contents of a larger, slower memory. By transparent, I mean that the user of the cache of the larger memory just thinks they're getting a fast memory. They don't really see the difference between the cache and the slower memory. The cache just sort of automatically has things which the user tends to ask, making the whole thing go faster. Cache comes from, you know, a word like a, a pirate may have a cache buried treasure somewhere. It's hidden and valuable. Okay. So what is the 3C model of cash behavior? So when you make a access to this cash memory combination, if it's found in the cash, it's called a hit. And if it's not found, it's called a miss, kind of like baseball. And what the three C's was to do was to try to get some insights into these misses because they're expensive. And some misses you just have to do because you've never referenced it before called compulsory misses in the model. Some misses happen because the cache can only be so big and still be fast. Those are called capacity misses if you exceed the capacity. And then finally, to be able to look up things and find things faster, caches get divided into smaller pieces called sets. And if you your set overflows, there's too many things there. That's called a conflict miss. I actually spent, by the way, some time with a thesaurus to come up with an alliteration, everything starting with C, and that made it uh, much more memorable. And people have found this to be quite intuitive to figure out what is uh, going on. And and so it was a nice result in my PhD dissertation. Okay. So what happens in a computer when a cache misses? So when a cache misses, it then goes to the uh, larger memory to obtain the data that it didn't have and brings that data into the cache. If the cache is full, it also has to evict some other data. And you're betting that the newly referenced data is more likely to be a good thing to be in the cache than the old data because programs tend to reference what they've more recently referenced. So if there's a miss, then it's slower for the computer to access the data. Exactly. And this is a big deal because without caches, and we actually do caches on caches on caches, computers would be a hundred or more times slower. And so, you know, your smartphone would not really be fast enough to do anything uh, that you you love without those (laughs) caches. Um, So I saw in one presentation where you're talking about the 3C model and you you said it was quote unquote wrong. so could you could you expand on that? What do you mean by it being wrong? So the 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 hand wave of the model says that all misses fall in these three categories: compulsory, capacity, and conflict. But the reality is actually more complicated because when you divide the cache into these smaller pieces called sets, you know you could, for example, have a pattern which the sets actually are a good thing and do better than a fully uh, flexible cache that could put things anywhere. These would be like anti-conflict misses. And that's not counted in the model. That's one example. The thing to remember with a model, a model is always a simplified version of a complex thing. And um, George Box, the great statistician, said, essentially, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And so even though the model is wrong relative to the full detail, it's useful because it, it provides um, very good intuition. Uh, people have told me. Hmm. 
So you're also part of a team that created a transactional memory system called log-based transactional memory or log TM. Um, so what is that? Right. So uh, in the old days, computers always had one processing core that did all the work. And we've moved to systems that have multiple processing cores. And software has to sort of coordinate how fast one processor core is going versus another. And that coordination can be hard. And so one thing that helps is if you could just say, hey, I want to do this unit of work atomically, you know, get my act together, get it finished, and then go forward. And that's called a transaction. And so LogTM was a system to do transactions to ease programmers. And it's so named because it uses something called a log. Hmm. What are the implications of using the log TM system as opposed to to other established systems that existed? Well, so the so the benefit is that it can potentially ease programming relative to using something called locks, which are much lower level of you know, going through the details. Um, but it does add some complexity to the hardware. And uh, so far there's been some limited implementation of more restricted transactional memory systems, but sort of not broad success. LogTM is even more complicated, so it hasn't been done, but it inspired a lot of thinking. And what we see in computer architecture often is ideas sometimes gestate for many decades before they're, they actually go somewhere. So I'm still optimistic. Are there any historical uh, architectures of note that you could discuss that? sort of came out, didn't have much impact, and then down the line um, played a big role in in changing how computing is done? Sure. So um, one of the things that's critically important right now to uh, supporting deep neural networks or AI are general purpose graphics processing units. And within them, they do something called data level parallelism where a single operation uh, implies multiple manipulations. So, for example, one instruction, I should say instruction, not operation, one instruction might take 64 numbers, add it to 64 corresponding numbers for 64 results. Okay? This idea has gone by many names and was first proposed in the 1960s with systems like the Illinois ILLIAC-4 and had some niche successes, uh, like in Cray supercomputers, uh, but just kind of kind of hung around as a specialized thing for f- like four decades before it exploded into being a gigantic success in graphics processing units. Wow. So in one of the presentations I watched of you talking about the log TM system, you had sort of this four quadrant chart with deferred and eager conflict detection as sort of two potential settings, like on the left hand side. Um, and on the top of this box, you had uh, deferred and eager version management as as two other alternatives. Could you talk about those things? Like what are deferred and eager conflict detection and and version management? Okay. Well, so first of all, transactions when you do them it's possible that there's a concurrent transaction that is incompatible with it. And if if everything's okay, you commit. And if there's a problem, you might have to abort one of the transactions. And so think of a transaction which is doing a move, like taking something from one data structure to another. Uh, If it commits, you both remove it from the first data structure and add it to the second. If it aborts, you do nothing, and uh, but you never like are partially done. Like you've removed it, and then it just never appeared anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, what a transactional memory system has to do is first detect whether there's any conflicts requiring an abort, and it can do so as the transactions execute. That's called eager, or it can do it at the end of the transaction when just sort of double checking if everything's okay. And that's called lazy conflict detection. Orthogonal to that, which, you know, two by two gives you the four quadrant is uh, lazy version management versus eager version management. So 
What version management is about is that within a transaction, you sometimes overwrite an old piece of data. And when you're all done, which do you need, the old piece or the new piece? Well, you need the new piece if you commit, and you need the old data if you abort. So you need both. And so only one can sort of be in the final resting place. The other has to be in like a buffer on the side, a temporary scratch place. Um, and so eager version management says, hey, I'm, I'm, I think things are good. I'm going to put the old value on the side, put the new value in place. And um, that way, when you commit, everything's fast. Whereas lazy version management says, well, I'm not sure I'm going to use a new value, so I'll leave the old value there until I know the new value is good. And log LogTM was one of the first to really do a very rich, uh, eager version management system in a transactional memory system. Okay. So have there been more eager version management systems that have come out since then? Uh, no, it hasn't really caught on that much. Uh, most of the tr systems that have happened have been very uh, limited. Um, they don't allow big transactions, and so it was easier to just do some temporary buffering of the new values. Uh, but at another level uh, in database management systems, which also do transactions, in fact, did transactions long before transactional memory, they do the equivalent of eager version management in many cases. Okay. So you sort of mentioned this earlier, but uh, I want to bring this up. What is Moore's Law and um, what does its end mean for, for computing and for society broadly? So there's actually two Moore's Law. The, the real Moore's Law was Gordon Moore's observation, I think it was 1965, that the optimal number of transistors per chip is going to double every 18 months or two years. And the reason for this was if we got better at making the transistors, we could do a bigger chip. And if we could do bigger chips, a system might be able to be built with fewer chips. And so at any given time, how big a chip should be, there would be a, 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 a happy point in the middle. But that happy point would keep doubling every two years, he predicted. And that prediction was, was right for, for more than three decades, four decades, really. Um, but it's slowing down now because even though we can sometimes double the number of transistors, we can't completely use them for various energy reasons, and their cost is not going down like it used to. And so Moore's Law is dramatically slowing down. Uh, the implication of that is that Moore's Law, coupled with computer architecture heretofore, made computers faster, much faster at the same cost. And that allowed software people to both um, run older programs much faster without any changes, without thinking about the hardware. And more importantly, to, to dream up new things that ran like pigs on the old hardware, but you know, when the faster hardware would run well, so they could go bigger and bigger and more ambitious. And um, that, was, that was a great thing. Now that Moore's Law is slowing greatly down, if we want to do more ambitious things, like this artificial intelligence we want to do, we can't just do it by waiting and hoping for the hardware to get better. We have to figure out other ways, which is going to require a lot of creativity in software and a lot of creativity across the hardware software boundary. Hmm. So what are some possible ways that you've seen people propose to, to overcome this end of Moore's law? Well, the, the way that is uh, always hoped for is that somehow there'll be a new Moore's law or there'll be a new type of transistor or other kind of switch, which resumes the process. And that has happened in the past. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a good candidate for the future right now. A second thing that can help somewhat is that currently chips are relatively two-dimensional. They're like flat planes, uh, like northern Wisconsin, uh, not, not too many high-rise buildings. Uh, and we can start building higher-rise chips, which, if we can get the heat out, can they can improve performance by communicating faster. Just like people in Manhattan don't have to travel great distances to 
in, encounter other people. Um, but there's a limit to that. I think then the next thing we need to do is we take software, which has previously been implemented in many layers using abstractions or approximations between the layers to help manage complexity and sort of dive down and cross-optimize to get the fat out. Finally, I see a lot of promise in specialized accelerators, which target specific uh, types of computation to be extra efficient at. Like instead of being a general purpose processor that you can compute anything, you might be a, an accelerator that's good at video decoding. Okay. So could you explain what an accelerator is and how that works? Okay, so as I said, an accelerator is a specialized hardware block that can't do everything, but does some computation particularly well. It's named an accelerator because it's faster. Uh, in many cases, it's only somewhat faster, but it can really do the computation with 10 or 100 times less energy. And energy matters. Uh, obviously, it matters on your smartphone because your battery doesn't run out, but it also matters in data centers where... You know, they use a tremendous amount of power, and if they can save power, that's a good thing. How does it work? Well, I think the right thing to say is the beauty of a general purpose processor is that it can do any computation to be named later. But for that generality, you get a certain amount of overhead. Uh, maybe you can liken it to a, a situation where you you know, there's a lot of management that allows great flexibility to go in many directions, whereas another organization might have a very flat system where there's just one person telling everybody what to do, uh, in which case, you know, you just can't do everything that way. You can only do the specific things people were previously trained to do. That's kind of the way an accelerator works. Okay. So I know you've done a lot of work with accelerator level parallelism. Um, so could you talk a little bit about that work and maybe some of the other kinds of parallelism that exists within computing architecture? I know you mentioned data level parallelism already. So accelerator parallelism is a term that VJ Janapan Reddy and I coined and not generally accepted, but we were observing the fact that, uh, smartphones had dozens of accelerators and in any given use case, like recording or decoding video, um, you know, you might be using a handful of accelerators and you use them in parallel. This use of transistors in parallel has a long history because when you get more transistors, and there are also faster transistors, how do you go even faster? Well, the only way to go even faster is to use the transistors, the additional transistors in parallel with the other ones. So they're, they're getting it done faster. And uh, this is what we've been doing since the beginning. Um, but the problem is, is that it, as you get, you go from 1,000 transistors to 10,000 to 100,000 to millions to billions of transistors, the same ways of using them in parallel don't work anymore. Kind of like if you, you know, are told as a student, you know, congratulations, your income doubles. And you say, oh, great, I get to buy some small thing. Many doublings later, you're going to have to figure out how to buy yachts, okay? <laughs> Um, and that's that would be a good problem, but in computer architecture, we have that problem where we've had this many times doubling. So initially, we did something called bit-level parallelism, where you just manipulated bigger numbers or you like did the multiply in fewer steps than um, with, with a smaller number of transistors. And then we did instruction-level parallelism, where a processor core logically executes one instruction after another. But we cheat, this is one of the examples of cheating, and we execute many at the same time. Like recent processors from Intel and others might have 100 instructions in partial execution and still look serially. That's instruction-level parallelism. Thread-level parallelism is when we say, oh, you can't make the processor go that much faster. Let's use multiple processors and let software have to coordinate the multiple processors. They could coordinate with LogTM, for example. Data level parallelism, as I mentioned, has now manifested with great success in GPUs, but goes back to um, 
vectors and, and, and SIMD extensions and things like that. And that's where you have a single instruction that, it, that causes many operations uh, to happen. And we think accelerator parallelism is an example of uh, what's going to happen next. It's clearly happened in smartphones. And I think it's going to happen to make, for example, self-driving vehicles much more efficient. And uh, even in cloud services where uh, many of the services are uh, specialized, like you're processing video and things like that. So could you discuss a common accelerator use case? So, for example, if you uh, are using your smartphone to record video, there is a camera sensor that is producing a stream of information. And we'll, we'll focus on the video, not the audio. Audio is done as well. And you know, then it'll go through an image signal processor. Um, might have to go off chip to be buffered in DRAM or memory. Uh, and then it can be processed uh, you know, by the GPU, maybe a, again to the uh, instruction processor, the GPU, you know, et cetera. And uh, in the end, it can uh, go out to the display so that you can see it. And it also might be stored in a non-volatile memory or flash so that you can save it for later. Uh, and that's something that, you know, it's got an interesting thing because you're not trying to make it as fast as possible. You're trying to make it fast enough to record the video, and then you're trying to do it with as, l as little energy as possible to both save the battery and avoid the phone getting uh, too hot. And so the way phones work is that you have a number of these use cases, maybe 20 that are important, and you have to make sure that each one uh, you know, works sufficiently well. And I think many computer systems are going to move toward this kind of uh, model. Okay. So are there any major differences between what's on a cell phone or another mobile device and a computer in terms of how the computer architecture and the, the hardware works? Well, Kyrie, that's a, actually a great question. Uh, in 2018, I did a sabbatical at Google with a group looking at silicon for these kinds of things. And uh, I thought, what do I know about these kinds of things? Because I've never operated in the space. I've only operated it with big computers. But I had operated with big computers for, you know, actually almost 30 years at that time. And so these devices have grown up to be real computers. So they have all the standard components of compute, uh, interconnect, memory, and storage. Um, but they have them in different proportions and they have this abundance of accelerators, which classical computers have not had at this point, but I, I think will going forward. There was a recent Apple iPhone that had 42 accelerators. So prior to the iPhone with the, the 42 accelerators, what was a, a typical number for a phone to have? Right. So, the, you know, typical is hard to say because they were changing pretty fast. But if you look at a series of, of Apple iPhones from 2010 to 2016, um, the number of accelerators went from 9, 12, 17, 22, 29, 31, 36. And you can see climbing fast. Wow. So are most of these accelerators being used for things like the video processing you gave in your example, or is it a wider variety of functions. It's a wider variety of functions so that in any given use case, like recording video, you are not using 42 accelerators. You're using a relatively small number, like five or seven. Uh, but presumably these were all put on there because there's some important use case that needs them. But one of the things that I think we need to evolve is some of this stuff is put on there and Maybe when you put it on the chip, you don't know quite what the phone's going to be used for when it comes out. And so you might put things on unnecessarily. I think we need a better science for designing chips with multiple accelerators and accelerator level parallelism. You know, we tried to help a little bit with a, a model called Gables. Could you discuss the Gables model? What is that? Okay, so when you have a chip with 42 accelerators, I mean, how do you decide which ones to have and which ones to select? And, 
you know, how to size them and things like that. It's just very complicated. So it'd be nice to have a simplified picture to get a first answer, uh, not a final answer. And so Gables uh, was our attempt to do that, and it builds on something called Roofline. So the Roofline model was for a homogeneous multi-core chip, which is a chip that every processor core is the same. Mm-hmm. And it modeled the chip with a peak computation performance and a peak off-chip communication bandwidth in a plot that looks like a roof line. And so what Gables did is said, well, we can't model our 42 accelerators that way, but we can perhaps do a roof line for each accelerator because each accelerator is different, they're heterogeneous, and then find a way to combine them to model the whole chip. And that's what Gables does. And Gables gets its name by a roof that has many roof lines. Okay. So have you used this model on any products or technologies that that have shown uh, promise? Uh, I have not used it on products. However, I'm aware of at least two instances, one where it was uh, incorporated in the tool chain of a major tool provider. I'm not sure I'm allowed to say the name. And I know it was used for the development, preliminary development of some products at a major IT company. And they're still using it, uh, but I think that's confidential. But I will say, I think it's better than the community thinks it is at this point, because it's not like, you know, super popular. (laughs) Well, uh, yeah, maybe maybe now people will will think more about it. Um, Anything else you want to say about the Gables model? Uh, I'll just say this, that... uh, I think it's important when you encounter a complicated system to try to figure out a way to get your head around it. Uh, And, you know, Gables was our attempt to do that. And I think that model, it even has value if you don't believe the numbers, because it gives you a way to frame your thinking about the system and pay attention to these communication and these performance things and how they they interact. That's valuable, even if you don't believe the, the output of the number. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so talking about models, I saw you wrote a uh, a paper um, in 2018 called Three Other Models of Computer System Performance. And in that, you uh, argue for the use of more simple models beyond Amdahl's law, such as bottleneck analysis, Little's law, and MM1Q. So could you talk about that paper? What was the argument you were making there? Right, so... I have found that computer architects are too quick to go to simulation. Simulation is where you write a computer program and that computer program mimics the system that you're studying potentially very well, but really very slowly. In fact, some of my most cited papers are simulation. I think you can also complement this with these simple models that are maybe less accurate, but give you a lot of insights. Okay, and uh, Amdahl's law is an example of that. It's fairly that's fairly well known that you have a, a part of a computation that you're speeding up, and a part that you're not. And Amdahl's law shows you that that part that you're not speeding up really limits what you can do unless it's vanishingly small. There's these the other three models are I find equally helpful for getting these first answers, not the final answers. So bottleneck analysis looks at sort of information flow. Think of a computer system as a whole bunch of pipes. You're trying to figure out how fast the water can flow. And it turns out that roofline and gables are actually just specific instances of bottleneck analysis. Okay, so Little's Law is broadly applicable. It it relates the number of items in a system to the product of the average time an item stays in the system times the average rate that items come in. That's very abstract. But for example, if there are 400 current students uh, and 100 students arrive every year, then the average student stays four years. And what's powerful about Little's Law is it relates those three numbers. And if you can easily figure out two of them, you can use Little's Law to uh, find the other. And um, David Wood and I used to do a lot of consulting, and we uh, we joked that we just kept applying Little's Law to systems to fix 
<laughs> performance bugs. Finally, an MM1Q has to deal with the fact that you know when things arrive at random, you know whether they're um, some requests in a computer system or people arriving at a store. At random is not exactly equal. Uh, and one way to model random is something called Markovian, which basically says when I arrive at the store, it's independent of when anyone else decided to arrive at the store. And what an MM1Q says is if people are coming in at random, Markovian, that's the first M, and they're serviced in about a random amount of time, that's the second M. And it, when we service one at a time, it, it shows you how well you can, you know, how much, how long people are going to have to wait depending on how busy things are. Uh, and it shows, for example, that you can't make a system that is always busy and has very low waiting times. That is a, it's a severe trade-off under the assumption of these random arrivals. And that's why doctors, for example, don't allow random arrivals. They make you schedule appointments. Uh, but this is a very powerful um, law to think about. It is an example of a rich field called queuing theory. That's it for this episode of the podcast. We'll be back next week for part two of my interview with Mark Hill. In that episode, Mark discusses the importance of hardware security, the impact of AI on hardware, and working in academia versus industry. Until then, remember to like, subscribe, and rate us five stars wherever you get your podcast. Learn more about the work of the CCC on our website at CRA.org slash CCC. And find us on social media to stay up to date on all our latest activities. Until next time, peace.